Uh, we're about ready to begin our equipping hour this morning. I feel like I'm starting late. No, I, I am starting late. Uh, my, my feelings are in accord with the truth just this once. Uh, this morning's equi- equipping our topic is emotions. And so, why don't I pray and we'll ask for God's help this morning from His Word to help us think through what are emotions, why do we have them, what should we do with them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You are good objectively, truly, universally, eternally. You do good. We are feeble, frail, unpredictable, all over the place. We are victims and perpetrators of a fallen world and fallen hearts. That We need your help to sort out how we feel. Lord, help us from your word, which is our compass, our recalibration, our accountability. Your word never fails. Your word is not fickle, it does not change, it gives light to the footsteps of weary travelers. Help us by your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. This morning's equipping hour is simply titled Emotions. Uh, We might encourage a longer title, something like Taking Emotions Captive, if I were to borrow Paul's phraseology from 2 Corinthians 10. What do I do with my emotions? How do I put emotions in their proper place? Should I be emotional at all? These are some of the things that we'll talk about this morning. And I want up front to put a couple resources for you. They're up on the screen and you can take a picture of them. The slide will be up at the end of this morning's message again. But I want to commend a few resources to you, the first of which is called Feelings and Faith by Brian Borgman. It was a book of the month that the elders recommended a couple of years ago. Maybe some of you read that, benefited from it. Maybe you put it on your shelf and the spine of that must read still stares at you. Uh, Let it stare some more, but take it up off the shelf and read it. Uh, You'll be encouraged. In fact, um, I wrote... Uh, a sort of a discipleship material on on emotions and have used it for years before Brian Borgman's book came out. And I've been sheepish about using my own material ever since because Borgman's book is so good. You must read it and you will hear things that I say that have been shaped and flavored significantly by him. Another resource on the screen is a book by Octavius Winslow. Uh, It is a book called The Sympathy of Christ. And I commend to you the practice of regularly reading a new Christology. That is an organized, systematized book on the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is one of those, but it narrows in on Jesus' emotional palette. It's titled The Sympathy of Christ in that Jesus is a great high priest in his earthly ministry, in his humanity, felt things. He expressed emotions, and he did so sinlessly, and having and experiencing emotions were not a fault of his character. Uh, So that's a really helpful book. Uh, It will help you love Jesus more. It helps us remember that emotions are not inherently sinful. And then the third resource up there is really for the adventurous. Uh, This one's by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, It takes a little bit more work to get into the flow of thought. Uh, but his book is titled Religious Affections. Uh, There are dumbed-down versions of that work. There are truncated versions of that work. There are various ways to get at Edwards' work. It's really helpful, and I would commend it to you, but perhaps third on the list as you're tracking these things out. My goal, well, my commitment to you this morning is to wrap up this equipping hour session in emotions This morning, I will not stop halfway through. If I start talking quickly at the end, you'll know why I'm committed to getting us done. And Brian Borgman preached a 22 sermon series on emotions and you can read the book. So we'll just leave it at that. However far we get us, however far we get, we'll move on to something else next week, but I'm committing to you up front uh, to not drag this out into two. There's much more that we could cover We certainly won't get to all of it. Why a message on emotions? 
I want to put before us some life goals, discipleship goals, pastoral aims. We are all emotional beings. And if we put emotions in their place where they belong by God's design and according to the pattern of God's word, then I think we have access to things like stability and access to unassailable joy in God. The the kind of joy that comes not mitigated by our circumstances. So we feel things, um, but I think if we understand why we do and what they are for and what we should do with them, that will give us an opportunity to not be victims of our own hearts, D- to not feel like we're hapless subjects of an emotional roller coaster and there's nothing we can do about it. So my goal this morning is to help us understand emotions so that we know what to do with them. We all experience emotions. We need to put them in their proper place. If we are to function well according to God's design, we need to have God's perspective on it. Let's talk about a definition of emotions. Uh, Shorthand synonym for emotions is the word feelings. I feel things. And and we talk about feelings as one of the five senses. We, We tangibly touch and feel things. We have a sensory perception at our fingertips that things are. And when we talk about emotions as feelings, we're not talking about the physical sensation of the presence of things. We are talking about a a spiritual sense or an an invisible sense, uh, another kind of sensory perception. We, We perceive things. They're feelings. And when we talk about feelings, much like being pricked by a pin that is not self induced, we can get the sense that feelings just happen to us. I was just minding my own business and wham, I felt something. Did I run into a brick wall? Where did this sadness come from? Why do I feel envy? And so we talk about feelings because we perceive them and and they happen to us. Let's go to Webster. Here's Miriam Webster's definition of of an emotion. It is a conscious mental reaction, such as fear or anger, subjectively experienced as strong feeling, usually directed toward a specific object, and typically accompanied by physiological and behavioral changes in the body. How does the dictionary define an emotion? A feeling. Usually aiming at something. It's not abstract, it has some root in reality or thought, and it is often accompanied by, typically accompanied by, physiological and behavioral effects. In other words, I feel an emotion and my stomach turns. Maybe I tremble, the hair goes up on the back of my neck. There are actually physiological components to the emotional well inside the human I don't think Webster's wrong there. Webster also says there are behavioral changes. Uh, What is meant by that? Well, you act on your emotions. You, You actually do things. The emotions have a role, and we'll get to this, but just know by your own experience that the more you feel something, the more fuel is added to the fire of will. You do things. And you do things with an energy that comes from what you feel. So we're going to talk at length this morning about the relationship between what you think, what you feel, and what you do. Those three elements of the heart of man, uh, the rational uh, acquisition of data, the feelings that come with how you think, and then the will to do. All of those are bound up in the heart. In fact, the the Bible's word for the heart is this internal, invisible command and control center. If you're thinking about NASA, the heart is Houston. Houston, we have a problem. We're going back to the command and control center of who you are. It's on the inside. Brian Borgman describes emotions this way. He says they are based on beliefs and standards and judgments and evaluations and concerns and thoughts. The emotions and reason are interdependent. The emotions are not simply impulses. They are indicators of what we value and what we believe. 
The emotions reflect and express the inner man, the heart, the soul, the mind. Emotions have an object. For instance, thinking about anger cannot make us angry, but thinking about the injustice of abortion can make us angry. And so Borgman and Webster intersect in their definitions. In fact, when Borgman gets around to giving his definition of of emotions, he says this, the emotions are an inherent part of what it means to be a person. They express the values and evaluations of a person and influence motives and conduct. So from the dictionary definition and from a mind saturated by the word of God and, and God's perspective on what emotions are, you have significant agreement Let's think about some emotions. You can be happy. You can be sad. There is joy, sorrow, anxiety, unforgiveness, jealousy, two kinds of jealousy. There's a good kind and a bad kind. Anger, emptiness, loneliness, bitterness, fear, resentment, sullen vexation, discouragement, confidence, hopelessness, and you could add many more to the list. There are other dispositions that seem like a lack of emotion that are also properly to be considered in this discussion. Indifference, aloofness, uncaring. That's all in this same variety, this same palette of emotional capacity. Some things that we feel are by definition sinful. But the capacity for emotions and the very colored palette of emotions are not of themselves sinful. Emotions significantly overlap with thoughts. And as we'll see this morning, emotions overlap with commands in Scripture, which means that they overlap with the will. We are commanded, for instance, to have joy. It's an emotion. You're told to have it. You must know that emotions predate the fall of man and they exist in the new heavens and the new earth. We've just sort of bracketed out our current condition, post-fall, pre-glorification. The only place you've ever lived, the only kind of humanity you've ever known, the only experiences you've ever experienced, a sinner in a fallen world. But you must know that emotions existed before then. And they will exist after sin and death are long gone. I think you have a wonderful expression of emotions in the Garden of Eden. You have God giving Adam the task of naming all of the animals right after God said, I will provide a helper suitable to you. And so out marches the aardvark. Hmm, I hope that's not it. (laughs) And you go through the alphabet. I started with aardvark because it's hard to find something ahead of the alphabet in aardvark, but it probably wasn't in English. So antelope, anteater, whatever else. You go down the whole list and Adam named all of these probably at the genus level. It would be a long day's work. And if you can imagine the intellectual capacity to come up with differentiable syllabic descriptions of featured beings, Adam was a genius. And he had to wait on the Lord for the promise of a suitable helper. Long parade of animals, long list of names that ostensibly Adam would have come up with on the spot and then remembered, cataloged, written the Encyclopedia Britannica over it. And at long last, God puts him to sleep, pulls a rib, fashions a woman. Uh, Man and woman in the English language are related um, differently than ish and isha are related in Hebrew. The the word for for woman comes out of man in Hebrew a little bit different than it does in English. Uh, Man and then Adam wakes up and he sees his suitable helper and he says, whoa, man, woman. It's sort of like that in Hebrew. And Adam's poetic discourse in that moment is, She was taken from me. She's suitable for me. And I think Adam is singing the first love song as he describes in praise to God this suitable helper. It's emotional before the fall. 
There are, of course, emotions in God, which are sinless and predate the fall and are eternal. And then there are emotions in the eternal state. You, you can't read Revelation 21, 22, or Isaiah 55, or any of the descriptions of the new heavens and new earth, the glorified state, the, the creation uncursed, and humanity glorified without catching the emotion-laden descriptions of them. Heaven will be emotional. It just won't be sinful. So in other words, emotions in themselves are not necessarily sins or sinful or the products of the fall of man into sin. So why do we have them? What are they for? And the, the outline here is just really simple. Um, I don't have all of the scriptures on the screen for you. It's just going to serve sort of a roadmap for this morning, for us this morning as we talk. But what are emotions for? And, and I want to begin by the negative. What are emotions not for? And let me give you three categories. Decision-making, discerning the truth, and measuring spiritual maturity. That's not why God gave you emotions. God did not give you emotions in order to make decisions. Emotions are terrible decision makers. Don't put them there. Don't put your deciding what you're going to do next into the capacity of emotions. Your emotions were not built for that. It's not why they exist. Secondly, emotions are terrible at discerning the truth. They're not reliable for that because they were not made for that. Uh, what is the reliable course for discerning the truth? Um, we are dependent epistemologists. It just means if we're going to know what we know as creatures, we must get our know what we know and how we know what we know from the knower of all things, the creator of all things, and the one who holds us accountable for what we know. We are dependent in how we know what we know and what we know. Go get your knowledge from God. If you're looking into the deep well of self, particularly this emotional well, Looking for truth? My friend, you're looking in the wrong place. So, emotions are terrible for decision making. They're terrible for discerning truth. And thirdly, they're terrible for measuring your spiritual maturity. Or they're terrible for measuring the state of your soul. They're terrible for assessing the quality of your heart. They're, they're terrible at making value judgments. It's not what emotions are for. And I, I cut my teeth in my early spiritual life in a context where emotionalism was the measure of your spiritual maturity. On a Sunday morning at the, at the spiritual gas pump, when you came to, to get more juice for the next week, did, did you get pumped up? Were you on your feet? Were your hands in the air? Were you uttering things you didn't understand? Were you being knocked over by the Holy Spirit? I was in that context and... and the rest of the week was this desert. I needed to get back to that experience, that emotion, because emotion is worship. Emotion is where I'm doing right with the Lord. It is the full measure and expression of my spiritual maturity. No, it's not. God never defines your spiritual maturity by how you feel about it, much less how you express your feelings, which can just be rank hypocrisy. They can be rank idolatry. In other words, you can express contrary to what you know and feel, uh, contrary to what you know and believe, um, what you should obey, what you have obeyed. You can also express in ways that are actually idolatrous. I love the emotional experience. Emotions have their place, but they are not the ultimate. They are not the end. And when you put them at the end, you make them an idol. This is the whole fundamental problem with pleasure seeking rather than seeking God who gives pleasure. Psalm 1611 is clear. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. To the faithful, God will provide pleasures you and I cannot even imagine. But if we seek the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen, we are idolaters. And this is Maybe where we step on the toes of a, of a hero and a mentor and an author who wrote many, many books that have been helpful, but come under the banner of what is labeled hedonism, 
a, a God-centered hedonism. It, at the very least, it's the wrong word to describe what he's after. From him, through him, to him, are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Doxology, yes. But hedonism is a fundamentally negative word describing pleasure-seeking as its own end. I grant all the caveats <clears throat> in those very helpful works to get us not to be idolaters seeking pleasure. Um, but perhaps a hang-up for us is this overwrought centeredness on pleasure itself. It can at least be a stumbling block and a danger, something to be aware of. Remember that God possesses and expresses emotion. If you read your Bible and you ask the question, does God emote? And if you haven't got caught up in Anselm and Aquinas and early medieval theological arguments, or in their regurgitation in the last, say, four or five years, if you just read your Bible, you would say, God is angry, God is sad. God feels things. And, and, and this little rabbit trail is really for another equipping hour sometime, one devoted to theology proper and the attributes of God, and whether or not God expressing emotions means that God ontologically changes. There's a theological fight about that. Um, I disagree with the premise that emotions means a change of being, Therefore, a change in God, and since God doesn't change, therefore God doesn't have emotions. I can't get there. That's a logical deduction, not a biblical one. And if I'm stepping on your toes, just know that is a tip of an iceberg. We probably need to have a much longer conversation. Be aware there's a fight out there that says God does not have emotions. Um, some take the fight farther and say that if you believe God has emotions, you're a heretic and you've denied fundamental orthodoxy. Just know the stakes are high. And I recognize I'm way out on a limb here in some sense saying God has emotions, but I can't get away from that in my Bible. So there's that. Secondly, know that Christ possessed and expressed emotion. This is where Octavius Winslow is particularly helpful. Read the sympathy of Christ. By the way, believing that Jesus expressed emotions in his incarnation is no threat to the theological controversy I just described. Why? Because Jesus, as the God-man, 100% deity, 100% humanity, in his earthly experience, is expected to emote. So, these are really two different layers. If you're hung up on the first one, don't be hung up on the second one. Um, Jesus was clearly emotional, whether you say that's in his deity or his humanity or in both, for another time. But if you just open John 11 and notice Jesus' gladness, sadness, love, affection, brotherly love, anger, Jesus wept, you will see emotions in a sinless man. It's good to remember. And then just look at your Bible and notice that the Bible is not written by God in theological abstraction. The Psalms are particularly helpful here. The, the, the prophets are helpful. Jesus preaching in his earthly ministry is helpful. It's evocative. It's illustrative. There are metaphors and similes and, and appeals to feelings throughout the scripture. Uh, you are not to, we don't read the Bible and, and come away with God having written to us merely in sort of textbook abstraction, theological truth. God is a protector. Even that word is emotionally laden. But you, O oh Yahweh, are a surrounding shield. You are a shield about me. Not a little leather disc out front, but a shield surrounding me. That is emotional, illustrative, evocative language, and the Bible is full of it. And so emotions seem to be important to God and in his dealings with us. So what are they for? Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Why do we have them? 
Wouldn't it be better to be Spock? I'll just give you a window into an answer to the question. This isn't the full answer to the question, just a window. Psalm 16, 6. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is toned for. Um, who atones for sin? God does ultimately. Um, and what is, the, what is the source of that in him? Truth and loving kindness. Chesed, grace, undeserved favor, compassion, love. Okay, so on the God side of things or the forgiver of an offense side of things, there's truth and love. And then notice the second half of the verse. By the fear of Yahweh, one turns away from evil. Fear is an emotion. Fear is an emotion connected to thought, motivating action. So the mind, the feelings, the will. All these things go together. They're to be a sort of inextricable chain in the heart. Grounded in what we think, resulting in what we do. Emotions serve as a motivator, an engine, fuel to the fire, something along those lines. And, and notice the motivation here. By the fear of Yahweh, one turns away from evil. Fear is the emotion. Yahweh's identity, reality, is the truth. Who God is, who I am, fear. A reverence. Not an abject terror like running away from a grizzly bear that, that you're between mama and cubs. But the kind of fear that says, God can cast the soul into eternal hell. And he's my father. And he's glorious. And he's so big, I want to get closer to him, not run away. It's a remarkable thing, fear of the Lord in the Bible. And what does that emotion and the conglomeration of emotions bound up in fear of Yahweh, result in turn away from evil, turn away from sin. When we're attracted to sin, our fear of Yahweh has gone down. And conversely, turn to, Psalm, uh, turn to Proverbs 23. Verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with the rod and deliver his soul from Sheol. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart also will be glad. And my inmost being will exult when your lips speak upright things. There are emotions in principles and commands right here. Discipline your children. Why? You don't want them to go to the grave godless, do you? Fear it. Feel it. And then, son, listen. Do what I'm telling you. My heart's going to be glad. I will exult when you're godly. These emotions are motivators for right behavior on the Parent side and the child side. This gets us toward what emotions are for. I would say this. Emotions are flavored expressions of the mind. They are flavored with interest and investment. We, we might call emotions invested or interested expressions of the mind. They fuel our behavior. This is mind to will. Think about evangelism for a moment. What happens to people who depart this life apart from Christ? Without Christ. They go to the lake of fire and conscious eternal judgment, receiving what is due them for their deeds. Abstract theological path. It's subjective. It's outside of you. It's true whether you feel it or not. Oh, I know that to be true. Yep, people go to hell. Can you stop and feel it for a moment? And then what will you do? You, you'll do things if you feel it. Pray. 
walk around on ASU's campus starting awkward conversations with anybody who will talk to you? Go to the neighborhoods, have a bold conversation in your home, discipline your kids with the gospel in view. If you love people, tell your testimony. Get a right view of the facts from Scripture about how long eternity is, how right, clean, beautiful, and good, and holy the justice of God is, and how awful it is that unforgiven sinners meet it. Sit there. I I know it's hard. I know it's hard to read Revelation 20 and the great white throne judgment and to read the statement that everyone whose name's not written in the Lamb's book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. It's hard to sit there. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. It's hard to read those verses, read them and feel them and rescue the perishing. Go to the mission field. Live purposefully in this mission field where God has placed you. Where you already know the language and the culture and you have a way to live. (laughs) You need to feel it. Think about abortion. What is abortion? It's murder. Sin. When you compare the abortion industry to the gas chambers at Auschwitz or Dachau, It's not a faulty comparison. And the world wants to change the language. Don't change the language. We we gather up the most vulnerable and defenseless whom God created. The, The most needy who are people who must be defended by the strong, who must be defended by the laws of the land. And at the altars of convenience, self-love, failure to love God and others, first two commands, we murder the unborn. Abstract realities of abortion just sit there. But you think about it. You feel it. And the will is enervated. Go love a young woman in a tough spot. Adopt. Talk to David Britton about how you can help in the foster care system, which, which is the orphan crisis of our day. I would recommend you listen to his two equipping hours he's done on the topic. It is a monumental crisis in Arizona. Jump in with your hands and your heart. Feel the problem, (laughs) vote, pass laws, pray, preach the gospel for a seed change in culture that values life and loves God and loves others. Be motivated. Apply the same thing to trafficking, sex slavery in our day. Apply the same thing to parenting. We just read it in Proverbs. My kid will die without discipline. Feel it and do. Theology proper. There are abstractions about God. List the attributes. Take theology and play with it like a toy, if you will. Impress other people with what you know. Humiliate them for what they don't know. Or worship God. Be humble before him. And when God's name and his honor are maligned and defamed, the will gets involved when you feel it. Feel it. I know it's hard to disassociate self from the honor of God. I'm not sure I've sorted that out in my own life. God's honor is defamed when someone sins against me. I'm pretty mixed up. But we ought to feel it when God's dishonored. And we ought to do what we should do. 
emotions energize or enervate right behavior based on right thinking. To have an interested grip on truth rather than a disinterested acquisition of facts means we will behave as God would have us. Listen, if, if for you facts are abstractions and you get a hold of a bundle of them, you'll eventually get bored with them and trade them for some new shiny group of facts. But you and I, when you and I feel what we ought to feel as a result of truths, the feelings themselves provide a cement to the soul that can make us unmovable. We need to put emotions in their place. Let's talk about emotions versus emotionalism. Versus emotionalism. Emotionalism is, I want to gin up the emotions because emotions are in the Bible. I need to have some. I need to feel it. Uh, that's backwards. Emotions will come, will happen. There is a sense in which they happen to you. but The, the reality is they follow thinking. If you try to get to the emotionalism, the emotional experience, woo, I felt high. Without adjusting the thinking that's appropriate to be the bedrock of the emotion, then you're worshiping at an altar of idolatry. I want the feeling. Rather than allowing the feeling to do what the feeling's supposed to do, a service of the truth energizing the will. And we do this in, in singing. Man, I, it, I felt so great when we were all singing and, and, and the instruments dropped out and the a cappella voices just bounced off the walls. That was awesome. That was awesome? How about God is awesome and our emotions almost got close to thinking about getting anywhere near his infinite awesomeness. <laughs> Listen, it's appropriate for us to be emotional. The Psalms are full of it, and they are songs directed towards God. But don't be heartless in your singing. Mean it. Sing it loud. But you're not looking for the experience of communal loud singing as the end. It ought to be the fruit of where you're at in the heart. Same thing's true in preaching. Listen, I, I grant preachers can be human tranquilizers. We can put each other to sleep. Some preachers can be entertaining. Keep you laughing. Put you in awe. Sometimes the, the packaging and the delivery can produce the artificial swell of emotionalism. This was true in Paul's day, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Oratory was an art form, and the guys who were really good at it got paid well. Paul didn't get paid, and he chose not to impress what was prized by the culture. It, we're kind of weird, aren't we? I mean, we listen to sermons for entertainment. That's like sort of recreation for Christian nerds sometimes. And we have our favorites and we, we log how many we listen to of so-and-so. And we get kind of close to the, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. And we have to be warned away from those things. And you have to admit we're weird. Like I got excited about a sermon <laughs> Outside of these walls, they were like, what in the world? I think good preaching pokes the emotions because the preacher has been poked in the ways he needs to by truth and responds as he ought. And there is a skill in conveying it that has to be cultivated and labored for. And there's an appropriate response in people. I see you, Corey. We were going to have this by email exchange later this week. <laughs> Corey, I, I shouldn't point you out. I'm, I'm already down that path. I've run the rabbit trail, so I'm sorry. Um, Corey wears on her face what the passage says. <laughs> Some of you are, are really wonderful to look at when you're preached to. I would say most of you are not as good Bible students you got your Bible open, you got pens out, you got an app that sometimes starts reading the passage out loud. <laughs> and you look like this. And I have no idea if the Word of God is resonating, and that's okay, I have to trust the Lord. But some of you look like how someone should feel when they hear truth. All right, enough of that. 
Emotions can be all over the place. If you make emotions the generator of truth, or if you make your emotions the divining rod for decision making, or you make emotions the measure of your spiritual state, you are in trouble. Don't put them there. It's not where they belong. They are simply not the source of truth. They are not trustworthy for decision making. They are not reliable for assessing your spiritual condition. Jeremiah 17, 9 gives us a warning. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Desperately sick, who can know it? Your emotions are in that category. Don't trust you. And and of all the constituent parts of how you're made up in God's design, definitely don't trust your emotions. (laughs) If there's a part of you to trust, that's probably the caboose. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Um, We we will have an equipping hour in in a few weeks on self-trust, specifically to not to. But as a teaser for that, remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust Yahweh with all your heart. All of that command and control center, it includes your emotions. Trust Him and do not lean on your own understanding. Apply Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to this topic, and do not rely on your own feelings. It's a critical command. So what do we do? What do we do with our emotions? Here's the sort of next question on our roadmap this morning. Maybe you have said, maybe you have heard, maybe you believe but wouldn't dare to say out loud, I can't help how I feel. You must. You must help how you feel. Prepare for an onslaught of biblical proof texts. Are you ready? Open your Bibles. Turn to Proverbs. Four twenty three is a good place to start. Guard your heart with all diligence. From it flow the springs of life. 625. Speaking of the adulterous woman, do not desire, there's your emotion, and a prohibition. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelids. 725. Do not let your heart go astray into her ways. Do not wander into her pathways. No, 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 my, my heart, my feelings, they just go wherever. They, I, can't, who, I can't help them. Stop them. <laughs> Don't let them go there. You're wondering how. We'll, we'll get there. I'm, I'm looking at the clock. We'll get there. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to emote, what's the emotion? Anger. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his own spirit than one who captures a city. This is a matter of self-control. Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart be jealous of sinners, but be in the fear of Yahweh always. Verse 19, my son, listen, be wise, and direct your heart in the way. There's a path, you tell your heart to get there. The junior high girl that says, but I I have a crush on him, daddy. I just love him and I can't help how I feel. Tell your heart what to do. Get your heart in the way. No crushes. <laughs> Matthew 18, 35. My heavenly father, 
will send you to hell if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Got to forgive him. Got to feel it. First Peter one twenty. Uh, go to Luke twelve five. I will show you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Fear him. Two verses later, prohibition. Don't fear. (laughs) How does that work out? Fear the Lord. You have nothing else to be afraid of. Command, don't fear. I'm afraid. I can't help it. Command, fear Yahweh. Don't fear hunger. Don't fear enemies. Leave out a, a lot of commands here for joy, peace, prohibitions against anxiety, commands for love. This all is a matter of self-control. Galatians 5.23 lists self-control as part of the multifaceted fruit produced by the Holy Spirit in the heart. So, how do I apply these texts? If I understand that Emotions are the fuel for right thoughts to motivate right action. And I'm actually commanded to get a hold of them, to lasso them and make them submit and serve in the role that God has designed them to be. How do I do that? I want to give you two fields of strategy. One, in the emotional moment. And the other, outside the emotional moment. And I separate out these strategies just from my own personal experience. I I, I have found separating these out to be helpful. I hope that you find this helpful. Strategy number one, in the emotional moment, be skeptical of your emotions. Jeremiah 17, 9, don't trust them. In the emotional moment, number two, think on what is true. Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is trustworthy, right, noble, Whatever is true, think on these things. That is a command to put your mind on what is real. By the way, the think on what is true also excludes things like probabilities, possibilities, potentialities. This is a root of a lot of anxiety, right? But this could happen. There could be a lion in the road, so I shouldn't go to work. Uh, okay, but you're going to starve. So feed the lions or feed yourself, doesn't matter. Get out there, cross the road, and go to work. But what if? Think on what's true. Philippians 4, 8 overrules the what ifs. You could, think, you could spend all your life thinking about the what ifs for next week, and God takes you home tomorrow. It's not true. Set your mind on what's true. Past is true. Present is true. You don't know what the future is. That's presumptuous. Now, I'm saying it like it's easy. (laughs) I know it's not easy. In the moment, be skeptical of your emotions. Think on what's true. Thirdly, take your thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians 10. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There's a context there. It's important. I'm drawing out a principle in short related to emotions. Take your emotions captive. Tell them to go to jail. Tell them what to do. You will obey Christ. Tell them in the emotional moment that they're out of their lane. Do what you know to be right. Find a command, find a gap in obedience, and fill it. I'm so worried about blah, 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 and my my day is just consumed with all this worry. Is there somebody to serve? Is there something you should be doing? Um, Go do that. When we worry, we're sinning already. When we worry, and it consumes us so we neglect duty, we're sinning some more. (laughs) In the moment, what should I be doing right now? Let's at least start there and do that. In the moment, pray. It probably should be number one. Help. Right? That's the fundamental language of prayer. Dependence. What does dependent prayer look, look like? God, you're my help. I'm going to wait on you. 
Content, obedient, trusting. Not, God, fix my circumstances while I worship these idols. God, I need you. Help me. Read the Psalms. Get help from the Psalms in this. And then sixthly, in the moment, trust. And trust something specific. Emotions may not immediately change. You might not feel peace right away. Trust God while you wait. And know this. Emotions come around. They do. Remember, the job of emotions is not to determine truth or to decide what to do or to measure who you really are before the Lord. That's not their job. They have, they have a non-lead position in your life. They follow objective realities in order to motivate obedient will. So don't get them out of place, but know that they'll come around. Here's a resolution. My emotions will not govern. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, most of your unhappiness in life occurs because you are listening to yourself rather than talking to yourself. Here are three questions Rick Holland gives related to emotions that are helpful. If you need sort of a checklist, what do I feel? Write it out. What do I think? Write that out too. Because your emotions are following, resembling all over the place, but they have something to do with what you're thinking somewhere. So what do I think? Thirdly, what do I know? And, and the reason those three questions are important is while there is a connection between what you feel and what you think, there should be, but not always is a connection between what you think and what's true, what you should know. And, and by the way, the knowledge there is different than your creedal ascriptions. Like, oh yeah, wh what do I know? Uh, just um, footnote the doctrinal statement of Grace Bible Church. That's what I know. Yeah, yeah do you really know that? <laughs> so we need to move outside the emotional moment. Borgman says this, if we obey commands by faith and we own the promises through prayer, prayer then we will experience peace. And he's reflecting there on Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Uh, anxious thoughts. Uh, what do I do? Um, recognize them. Obey God. And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Uh, you, you actually have to go to God with these things and believe him. So there are strategies for inside the emotional moment. What can I do right now when I'm feeling things that have me all askew? But then let's step outside of the emotional moment and think through some other strategies. And, and I have these on this different field of strategy because I don't do these things well in the emotional moment. I'm consumed. I'm clouded. Uh, number one on my list here is fix the fountain. What I mean is trace the emotions to their roots is there pride? Is there self-interest? Is, is there expectation that's not being met? And what is it? Sort it out. This takes work. Is there faithlessness in my life? And um, do I tend to let, let my emotions rule the roost? What are my tendencies? I need to examine all of that outside of the emotional moment. And, and do you know what we do normally? I have the emotional moment. I need help now. Urgent, urgent. Call somebody. Call Scott Demarest at two in the morning. Do that. You should. He told me you should call him at two. <laughs> and we feel the urgency. And then we get something off our chest. It has a cathartic effect. And, and the circumstances die down a little bit. And we go, Whew. we have not yet begun to fix the fountain. Go back to the source. When it's calm, peaceful, got your latte and your desk, maybe it's raining outside and the, the, the pitter-patter of raindrops on the roof just has this soothing, calming, artificial effect. And trace out, where do I go astray between what God's word says about himself, about my circumstances, or about me? And then I end up in this emotional mess. Outside of the moment, fix the fountain. Secondly, find for your thoughts profitable employment. 
Maybe one of the problems is you subject your brain to emotionalism. Or you're entertained by things that tug at the emotional strings and you love the tug. So you live on the emotional roller coaster because for as terrible as the lows are, wonderful are the highs, and there's something kind of thrilling and exciting about going like this all the time. Um, that's not God's design. Sort out the inputs. I'm not going to make my comment about Hallmark movies. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Just, they're not sin. Okay. Fill your mind with right thoughts. The Bible, good books, sermons. Replace errant practical th theology. Consider what your emotions say about God. I feel alone. Do you ever feel lonely? Are you ever alone? Ever? 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 I will be with you to the end of the age, Jesus said to his disciples. Do you believe in the omnipresence of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He is jealous for your soul. He grieves over sin in you. You're never alone. Everything we do is laid bare before the eyes of whom with, with, with God. <laughs> he is near to the brokenhearted. When you say, I feel lonely, your feelings are contrary to truth and they are assault on the character and promise of God. That's true. It sounds harsh. I'm not suggesting somebody, when they say, says, I feel lonely, you need to say what I just said. <laughs> Go be a comfort. But that truth is real. One of God's names in the Old Testament is Yahweh of armies, Lord of hosts. They who are with us, with him, greater than any army that can come against. You're, you're never alone. You're not alone when you breathe your last breath, close your eyes, and Jesus shepherds you by the hand into the next life. You're never alone. You have to have your theology correct, the emotional outbursts. Psalm 1, don't walk in the counsel of your emotions. Don't stand in the seat of your wayward feelings. Delight yourself in the law of God. Romans 12, 2. Don't be squeezed into the mold of how the world tells you you should feel. Don't be squeezed into the mold of the enemies of your soul, your errant, unpredictable, unreliable emotions. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That slow, methodical work to unthink wrong thoughts and reprogram right thinking is best done outside the emotional moment. And then I would just say, do right things. And you need to look at Genesis 4. Cain was emotional, downcast. Cain, won't your face be lifted up if you do what's right? There's magic in doing what's right. There's a secret formula there. Eyes off self, serving others, eyes on God. It's great medicine. I think emotions are like a dog. No. I think life is like a dog. And emotions are like the tail. Seen the tail of a dog? It's all over the place. If the dog runs north, where will the emotions go? Uh, they may not want to go mo north, but they're following the dog. G get the dog going in the right direction. Uh, let, me, let me give another resource. Um, trusting God, uh, Jerry Bridges. Knowing God, J.I. Packer. Um, you need to own those books and let them own you. Tremendous help for emotions. I feel like God doesn't love me. Fix it. <laughs> I don't feel justified. Justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone really has nothing to do with you. It's objective, outside of you, locked away in Fort Knox. It's not undone by your performance or how you feel about justification. It never changes. That's different than assurance of salvation, examining yourself to see if you're in the faith. But do you understand there are objective realities about the believer that don't change based on how you feel? We've got to fix the thoughts. Emotions are a grinder of the truth. 
And the reality is truth proceeds, governs, and interprets our emotions. Let me give you a couple theological anchors. Number one, the sovereignty, goodness, and purpose of God. We, we talked about that with contentment over the last two weeks. Let God's good sovereignty anchor your thoughts. And let that anchorage produce emotions in keeping with truth. Which will then energize right behavior in the will. Second theological anchor is justification by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. Listen, if Jesus has paid for you, you're blood bought. Others have said, that is a balm to cure all ills. Does it mean it cures all my emotional ills? Uh, No, but it's because I lack conformity to a right response to that truth. God loved me and sent his son to die in my place and purchased by the blood of Christ. I shall never be removed from his love. The third theological anchor is the universal and personal eschatology revealed in the Bible. Universal eschatology. What is God doing with this world? Personal eschatology. What happens to me when I die? You need to know all of that. (laughs) That is medicine for the emotions. If I know this life is short, I know where this world is headed, I know who's king, and I know what happens to me when I die. You need it. There's a reason that a third of your Bible is eschatology. God knows you need it. Listen to the emotions as I close with these lyrics. When peace, like a river, attends my way. When sorrows like sea billows rule, whatever my lot, You have taught me to say, it is well. It's well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet. I need a little um, humorous break for a minute. So it's not though Satan should buffet. Just in case you're reading the lyrics. Okay, that's better. (laughs) Though Satan should buffet. Though trials should come. Let this blessed assurance control. That Christ has regarded my helpless estate, shed his own blood for my soul. Listen to these emotions. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise, exaltation, glory to the Lord, oh, my soul. And do you feel this one? Lord, Haste the day. Sometimes when we sing this song and we go a cappella, a cappella singing slows down. We probably shouldn't slow down at this verse. It says, Haste the day. Lord, hurry up. We should probably accelerate. <laughs> Lord, haste the day when faith will be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The, sh- the trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. I don't know if you've thought about the even so. Wait, it sounds like a however. It is. The, the Lord coming down and the wrapping up of time and history for humanity's rebellious stay on the earth is not good news. Unless verses 1, 2, and 3 are true of your soul. God, you're the maker of all things and you're, you're the one that will separate the sheep and the goats and you'll sit on your great glorious white throne and judge deeds of man. Even so, it's well with my soul. Do you hear it? Do you feel it? And so we say, come Lord Jesus, hurry up. Let's pray. Lord, we would dare thank you for emotions um, and maybe not thank you for our errant ones. We thank you for emotional capacity by your design. We pray to live according to your design and, and not according to our confusion. You're good. You are reliable. You are trustworthy. Your word is a light to our path. Help us live according. In Jesus' name, amen.